Oh. Yeah. Do I need it? Okay, so uh, good morning. Hope everybody's really fresh from yesterday's uh, walkabout. Uh, so we gave it a few minutes just to set up. So Jason, you've got about one hour, 50 minutes. Um, so Jason's really going to give you a hands-on workshop on uh, covering how to write SE Linux policies. And so uh, he'll really go through the reference policy framework, which is, as it says here, um, but really it'll be like a hands-on workshop and kind of a, a deep dive into the trade-offs and, and kind of uh, how to define these policies and find applications. So um, what we're going to do is Jason's going to present up here. Uh, for anybody who just joined, um, he also created some images, uh, virtual machine images on here. If you want to pull those down onto your own laptop to walk along with the session and kind of experiment. So if you need this, just raise your hand or kind of we'll pass it around. Um, we're going to do this with video. So Jason, I think you're all mic'd up. I think so, yeah. yeah. Okay, so we'll get to go. And we'll be running until the first session until close on 11 o'clock. Yeah. Sounds good. Cool. All right. Can everyone hear me? All right. So this is SE Linux policy development. Um, we're we're going to go over bits of the policy, how the policy is made, then the different parts of the reference policy, the main the main bits to like make writing policies easier, and then we'll at the end make our own policy for the little web server that's on the images. I gave you. Uh, so who am I? I'm Jason. I'm a Gen C Linux developer. I look after the SC Linux policies on Gen 2. I'm also on the Harden team. I recently also am an upstream SC Linux maintainer for that as well. Um, so I will put the slides up on my blog after. I probably won't put the VM image up because it's big and it's like super insecure on purpose, so probably not a good idea. Uh, do you want the VM image? Um, so a quick bit about SC Linux in general. Um, SC Linux is secure and enhanced Linux, so it's extra stuff on top of normal Linux that hopefully makes things more secure. Uh, it is different from normal permissions on like Unix permissions in that it's mandatory access. The normal Unix permissions are what's called discretionary access control, DAC, which is up to sort of the user. Like you can set your own permissions on the files, you can set the user, you can change the group and stuff like that. And you can't do that with SE Linux. There's a global policy and you have to follow that. And it's loaded into the kernel and it will make sure it happens. Um, it covers quite a lot of things. There's hooks into all parts of Linux. You can do networking parts, you can do regular files, access control, so a whole bunch of things. We'll get into some of that later. Um, the base parts of the policy get loaded into the kernel when you boot. So if you look in slash etc slash se linux strict, you'll see um, policy.31. That's the 31st version of the policy. So that's the current one. Then in context is a bunch of files that have the file contexts around different parts of the file system. So when you boot, the policy.31 is the file that actually gets loaded into the kernel. The other ones are used by user space um, to relabel things and check different uh, things. So then this policy.31 is the one that's loaded. So where does that come from? That is built from lots of little modules that you have on your machine. On Gen 2, they're stored in user share SE Linux strict. There'll be a lot of .pp files. Those are one policy module per thing you want. So there's a Chromium policy, a cron policy, cups. There's a lot of them. If you do SE module L, like lists, there'll be a whole list of all of them. 
if you do list full, you'll see the different um, priorities. So if you want to override one of the system policies that's loaded in level 400, if you wanted to take like cron and add another rule to it, you could take the policy, keep the same name, add your own rules to it, and load it in level 500. Then it would mask the 400 level one when it gets loaded in. Um, so you could write these things in raw SALinux format, which is kind of verbose and kind of sucks. So everything uses ref policy, which is the reference policy not made for one specific distribution, but it's made sort of in general. So then all the other distributions take that policy and add on to it. Um, Red Hat's policy is based off of this, Gen2 is based off of this, Debian's based off of that. But they'll have small changes for maybe if they move things around with file systems and things like that. Um, ref policy is mostly M4 macros. So it's not the nicest, but you get used to it, so it's fine. Um, and the way it's split is each policy file, or each policy is made of three files. There's the interfaces in a .if file, and those are the ones that define how to use your policy for other, um, like if you're the cron policy, you might want to allow other policies around the system, maybe like the log rotate and things that would run under cron, they would need a way to set up the transition from cron to their types. So you would use an interface from that. And then the .te file, I actually have it, uh, I'm doing it out of order. Yeah, let's do this way. Okay. The .if file is the interface. The .te file is the actual rules for that module. And the .fc file is the file contexts for that one. So to label things on the disk later. To come back. Yeah. Uh, so permissions, the way uh, allow rule is set up, you allow a certain type access to another type, and then you give it a list of permissions it's allowed to do. And usually you need a lot of permissions like together. If you want to read a file, you can't actually just have read. You need to open the file first. So there's um, these defines which are set. So read, read file perms there will give you open permission and read inherited files. Read inherited files will give you get fractal on that. So if you use this read file perms um, define, it just gives you everything you need. And uh, everything underneath is usually safer, so read will be the one that, like, the most important one. Um, and then manage will give you pretty much everything. Create, unlink, write, remove, all, all, like, all of the things on it. So the setup of these name, or these defines, is um, the permission that you're getting and then the class, and then perms at the end. So the permission will be, depending on what the thing is, it'll be like read, write, manage. Uh, if it's directory, you can have add, remove, these things. Um, the class is different kinds of things, like file versus sock file versus uh, sim links. Uh, and if you look in the image that I gave, I put the whole policy source code in the roots home directory. So if you look in policy support object perm sets, that's where all these are defined, so you can go find some more of them. Um, and then on top of that, there's patterns, which usually you need to do a whole bunch of things together more than just the permissions. So if you need to read a file, it's inside a directory, so you need access to the directory first to be able to get the file. So if you want to just read the file, you need to search the directory. So if you want to like create a file, you need to add an entry into the directory on top. So there's create 
file pattern, which will take three things instead of two. It will take the thing that wants to do it, and then it will take the directory and the file type, because those might be different. You might have a file type, like Apache log type, and then it might be in the directory, like var log type. So you can't just give access to the entire directory just because you need the file. So it's split up like that. And um, yeah, so you might have apt gets to write files that are called app log t, and they're in a directory called var log t. Or if you want to read write the socket file for MySQL, it'll be in that directory and it's labeled that. These happen to be the same, but that like is not always the case, so you got to write out. Um, and they take three parameters. The container is the middle one. And the domain is the the sort like the source one who is running the thing, like your daemon or whatever your domain is. Um, file trans are very important and also really complicated to get your head around in the beginning. They are um, without these, and there's also DOM trans, which is to change domain. But they, the transition basically starts you in one uh, domain, and you end up in another, another domain, because otherwise everything would always be in one, which is useless. <laughs> so you might have a transition from init t into like Apache t, and then you would set a file transition, or no, if you would set a transition in general, you might have when init runs a file called Apache exec t, it'll end up with the process in uh, Apache t. And then file trans are what you encounter the most, because usually the problems are file labels on disk. So if you want to have a file or directory called Apache, and you want it labeled HTTP log t, and it's going to be in var log t, you can set a file trans pattern when HTTPD creates a file or creates a directory, and the directory is this parameter. When it creates it in this directory, it makes it into that label. So this pattern gives you only the bare minimum that you need on the direct on the parent directory. So you don't get more than you need. And then it sets up the, the permissions to create the new source, uh, the new directory. Um, you can do this based on any file name, which is usually the, the case. There's also file name specific ones, which is useful if it's not needed that often, but sometimes you'll have one daemon creates many files in the same directory, but they need to end up as different types. Uh, if you think like init or something like that, init will need to create like the PID files for different daemons in a certain directory. Or maybe it's creating them in run, and it needs to create like run Apache, run MySQL, and they need to be different types. So then you would create a named file transition on that specific name. Uh, it has to be a specific name. You can't like you can't do any regexes for this stuff. It, it it has to be specific match only, no like prefixes or anything. So it kind of sucks if you have stuff in like temp because usually people in temp give things random names. Like they'll name it like Dropbox dash and a whole bunch of numbers. So it doesn't work at all for that. So yeah, it kind of sucks. But it's needed when you need it. Uh, so the policy modules, if you look in the home directory on the VM, I made a really simple myapt for a simple Python web server. And it's split into three things. So the idea is basically every module should have its own stuff and only the module can access its own types directly. So that's why you need the interfaces. So if Apache wants to allow other people to read and write its log files, its log files are going to be called Apache 
log t or hbd log t. So other people can't use that type directly in their other ones. So they will call the interface instead, and the interface will set up like, the rules they actually need. This allows, like, if you need to change types underneath, you don't have to change every other module around. Um, in general, the name of all the types and all the interfaces in the module should be named the same. Some modules are not as good as, at that as others. Apache is kind of a huge monster of a policy, because a lot of different things the web server does, so it's kind of all over the place. Most of the types actually start with HTTPD instead of Apache, but yeah, I don't know. Um, so if you build it, you use the make file that ref policy puts on the system. Uh, I've actually symlinked it in the VM, so it should just work if you just type make. And then you load the module in. So this like se module dash i apache.pp, then it'll load up the pp, like the policy module, into the whole like list of all the other modules in the system, put them all together, and then save it back as that policy at all 31 file from the beginning. And then that gets loaded in the kernel. Um, interfaces. These are the ones I've been talking about all the time. They're named in general module name, uh, verb, predicate. So Apache append log or uh, logging is the module for most things under var log and stuff like that. So if you want to file trans to the log type, or from the log type, rather, or gpg dumb trans, this will allow apt to run gpg. And when it does so, it'll run it in gpg t. Um, modifier is uh, usually don't audit. So there's another set of rules which are like allow rules, except when you run them, uh, they don't allow any access. They just tell it to shut up about things. There's a lot of programs try to do things, but they don't actually ever need the thing. Like they try to just get at her on like a lot of files, but they don't actually need access to any of them. So you could either give it the rule to make it shut up, or you can just tell it to shut up. And then it stops your logs filling up from all the other stuff. So um, occasionally, one of these don't audits will hide something that's actually like important for your, like you, you try and run things, you don't see anything in the logs, but it still doesn't work. Then you can run se module dash d b. And d will tur turn off all the don't audits in the entire policy. And then you will get really everything. It's quite overwhelming, but sometimes you need to do that. And then to turn them back on, you just se module dash b, and it will rebuild the whole policy again and like have the don't audits on. Um, finding interfaces. This is the hardest part. You pretty much have to, and you get them pretty quick after a while, but it does take a while to get used to. Uh, the names are pretty good in general. Like you, you can usually guess very close to what the name will be after seeing them for a while. But to help with this, there are these um, bash macros, which will search the policy for things that you need. So if you want, for example, a file trans for logs, but you don't know exactly what it's called, then you can se find if um, file trans, it's a, it's a regex, so dot star instead of star var log. And then it'll search through everything. It'll say, oh, in logging.if, I found um, logging log file trans. And this is, the map, this is the line within that interface that matched what you searched for. Um, and then there, there are more. I just cut them out from the slide. So you find that one. And that one looks like the right one. Then you can se show if logging log file trans. And it'll show you the entire interface. So if you look at that one, and then you see, oh, there's a file trans on log, and it also gives you symlink access. So that's probably the one you want. And then you can use that in your policy file. Uh, and se, so there's se find if and find def, and se show if and show def, because interfaces and defines are 
different places in the policy. So you, like the, the defines are they're not very many of them, so they're pretty easy to know when something should be a define, so try that, otherwise it's always an interface. Um, Booleans are another part of the policy. They're very important. Um, and the basic idea is that different programs have lots of different features, but you don't always want to access all of them or enable all of them. So if you think about it, your web server might just serve static files. So you wouldn't want the web server to have access to anything else. The very basic case is it accesses like var www HTML and only files in there it can read and nothing else at all. But then maybe you have um, like a MySQL server on the same machine and then it's fine, it can access it over the SOC file. Then it wouldn't need any access. But maybe you have your MySQL server on another machine, in which case then you need Apache to connect to like the database over the, over the internet. Then you can enable this HTTP can network connect, and then it can connect over there. There's actually several Booleans. If you look at um, se manage boolean l, you'll see a uh, whole list of them and the description for them. Uh, there's HTTP can network connect, which gives you all network access. You probably don't want to use that one. Then there's a HTTP can network connect DB. There's memcache, specific ones that you'd probably want if you don't want to give it everything. Um, then the way you set these up in the policy is you first make the tunable. So you give the name of it. And then the false at the end is the default state for it. So ref policy says that they should always be disabled. So you use that for um, if you want to choose whether to make it a negative or a positive, it should be off by default. And it should, um, like, the, the defaults, they will always be off, and then you can enable them as needed. Uh, some distros, Red Hat enables quite a lot of them to make things work easier in the general case, in which case you might want to turn some off. Gen2 turns some on, but leaves almost all of them off. Uh, I don't know for Debian. Um, all right, so now if you want to play around with a real policy, I gave around a VM image. It's got a really simple Python script, which listens on port 8080 by default, and it saves its logs in var log server somewhere. Um, so by default, I loaded the policy already. It should just work if you load it up, and then you can like curl localhost 8080, and it'll give you some stuff out. Um, you search dash m to look for AVCs and recent. Recent's about last 15 minutes. There's also a dash ts like today or something like that. If you want to get longer time and look at them. And then uh, that's how I made and loaded the policy. So if you do that, you'll get it. If you instead do se module dash x 500 to say the level 500 one, and then dash r my app it'll remove the policy. So if you do that, then the whole Python script will just like die. So this is the VM. If I show you, can you see that? Maybe not. Huh? No. I don't know how to do that. Is that bigger? That's a bit bigger. All right, so if we look at this, that's the, it, it's not very much. I took most of it from Stack Overflow. It saves the, it saves the logs into var log server dot log, and it binds the port 8080 by default. So if you run this, uh, and then on another one, if I curl, it gets a request. 
it's not very interesting the, the demon itself it's so then if we look in see Linux these are the three files in it so if we look at my app dot te this is the policy that allows this script to work the top you define the type for the domain and the type for the file and in general they're named my app t and my app exec t it's just sort of well, it's not required but it's sort of convention so everyone kind of understands usually what they mean then this is an interface which sets up all the really common operations you need. It will mark my app exec t as a file type, so it can be on disk. It'll mark the other one as a domain, and it'll set up the transition from your normal user running it to allow it to run these things. And then there's the type for the log, and it's a log file. Uh, then this needs to be able to do stream socket stuff for TCP. So this is a self rule, which means that the source and destination are the same thing. For some rules are like that, others are not, depending on what the thing are. Uh, then if we go to these core net rules, the core net TCP bind generic and bind HTTP cache port. So this allows access on HTTP cache port type which is port 8080. I did not actually give it access to the HTTP port, like the main one. So if you try and run this script on port 80 instead, it'll die with permission denied. So if you want to see what the ports are, you se manage port L, and then there's a lot of them. <coughs> and you can grep through whatever you want. So if we look for, there are HTTP cache port, which are these ones. There's HTTP port, which is AD443. Try, if you wanted to add also here, uh, bind HTTP port instead, and then load this up. Oh, I think I need to turn off the patch. Now if I run it, it'll actually bind to the port. So you can give it access on a per port type basis. There's another way, if a, if a policy only gives access to a certain port, and you really want to bind Apache to port 1234, you could modify the policy like that, or you can use se manage port port, uh, so there's se manage port add, and then you can add the protocol only TCP ports under port number 1234 would be given this like HTTP port T, and then Apache would be able to bind to it as well. Uh, what else? So if we look in uh, it's not a very complicated policy. So the only context I set was uh, on the main file of it, and it's named my app exec t. So that's the one that will let it know. Uh, I don't know. Let me try. Control plus. No, but this is DMware, or this is. Uh, Ceiling. Yeah. Is that better? Damn it. I don't know how to make it bigger. <laughs> oh well. Uh, sorry. Maybe you can move closer. So if you do ls dash z, capital Z, then you get the context as well. So the, like, without is that. So these are the extra bits down the, well, that's really small. Uh, it's labeled my app exec t, and this is the one that lets the transition happen. So if you 
instead change the context on this to just bin t and set it now it's regular bin t and then you try and run the server it's going to fail because regular bin t means that it, you can just run it but it doesn't do any file transitions or anything so if you fix up the if you put the file context back to what it should be then it works again Uh, I only made a really small interface for this. Uh, usually every module should have a role interface, which accesses that different roles need to use. So there's like regular users on the system will run under user T, and the sysadmin will be like sysadm T. So there's different role policies as well. If you look in, um, there's, uh, there's a staff module, there's a user, mo the sysadm module, there's a user domain module. Um, so each of these modules will call the role interface on all these other modules and then give it access. I didn't do it properly on this one. I added it in itself like this, which you're not supposed to do. If you put it in the real policy, this line at the bottom should actually be in the staff module or in the sysadm module. Uh, but this keeps itself contained in this thing. Uh, and then we can go through some other of these interfaces. Uh, the use interactive FDs and the use inherited terminals, these are the ones to allow the module to print to your screen. If you don't give that one, then you run things and they'll all be silent. And it's kind of weird until you remember. <laughs> um, then this was the log transition, pretty much what I explained earlier. Uh, yeah, it's quite a short module, so not that useful. This is the whole policy itself. So if you look in policy, if you look in policy support, there's all these different support macros. So these are the ones I mentioned earlier. Uh, first, there's a whole bunch for different class sets, uh, which are like directory class. They're not used very much at all. Then these are the more useful ones. So these are get attribute on files, set attributes, mmap the files, exec the files, append them, read, write, create. So there are a lot of these. And they all follow the same naming convention, so it's really easy to know what they're called. Uh, and there's all so they're not just for files. Like on regular things, everything's kind of the same file, but there are different classes specifically for block files versus char files versus sockets. So if you give access to a file and somebody changes the file underneath suddenly to be a symlink, it doesn't work anymore. Like it's specifically kept separate for everything like that. So you need to keep in mind when you write the policy if people might be changing that to a symlink as well. You might want to give that permission anyway. So most of the modules are under policy modules and there's a bunch of different ones. So if you look under contrib, there's a lot of these. So if we pick a, like a, there's a policy on Chromium. It has first a whole bunch of Booleans because maybe not everyone wants to run Java, so you can turn that off. And then there's a, one to allow Chromium to read 
USB devices if you have a YubiKey or something like that. And that's off by default as well. And these are all the types, and there's a lot of different things. Then we get to the optional policy part. So these things might not always exist in other systems. Since the policy is very modular, you can load only the modules you need. So if you don't have cups loaded on your system, this cups read config and cups stream connect, those two interfaces require cups to be present. If it's not loaded, those two will fail. So this optional policy block means that it will check all those interfaces what they require. And if it doesn't, like if, if the requirements aren't matched, it takes the whole block out. So you can use uh, cups like that. So the dbus one, there's access for all the different dbus things altogether. So if they don't work, it doesn't keep part of them. It'll, keep, it'll knock out the entire block, not just part. Uh, there's also if defs if you need to set the, they're kind of like tunables, but they're set during build time, so a user can't change those. So you have to use them because you can't use a tunable everywhere, but try not to use them and try to use tunables instead because they're better. Uh, are there any questions or something in particular you want to see or do or? I cover, uh, shoot. Did I do? Uh. So if I'm deploying a server on say Red Hat or something, so should I like start off with disabling all the modular interfaces and then set like the ones I need? Or uh, what do you call Uh Red Hat enables a lot of them because they don't know exactly what you're going to use, so they want the general case to work. Um, there are some Booleans which you may want to look at. Like there's a there's something like allow Kerberos, which Kerberos requires network access for everything that uses Kerberos. So if you don't use Kerberos, you probably want to turn that one off. I don't know if they have it on or not by default, but if they do, because you might use Kerberos for logging in. So then you obviously want to keep it off. Like you don't just turn everything off because then you're like locked out of your machine. But you can read the descriptions for them. Uh, SE manage this command, boolean-l, will list all the names of them, the description over here. And the on-off thing is there's two ways to set it. You can set it permanently in the policy, so it'll happen every time you reboot. It'll be back to that state. Then you can set them on and off only now. But they're not saved in the policy, so next time you reboot, it'll be back to what it is by default. So uh, there are some, like there's this secure mode uh, policy and in smart and policy load. If you turn that one off, or if you turn that one on, then you can never reload the policy at all. Like it removes all the permissions to allow you to reload the policy. The only way to reload that one is to reboot. So it's disabled and then load it again. So if you have a really secure system, you might want to set things up, make sure they're all working, and then flip that one on. But you probably want to set it on boot every time, because if you set it permanently, then like disabling it's a real pain in the ass. Uh, and you don't want to just turn off everything. Because there's, for example, global SSP is the one to allow every domain to access view random because you need it for the stack smashing canaries. So if you turn that one off, then it's worse than on. So don't just like turn everything off. It's not the right answer. But you 
do read through them. Maybe you want to uh, like grep for on and see which ones are on, and then maybe decide if you want to turn them off. Or yeah, like console login. That's probably not something you want to turn off either, because otherwise you can't log in your machine. Uh, Anything else? So how do you test your policies? Oh, that's a thing I completely forgot. Hello. Um, how do you test your policies? Yeah, thanks. I completely forgot to explain that. Um, mainly you write the policy and run it. And then, so if I, my app. If I remove the policy for this thing I wrote, now it just won't work at all. If I list this because it doesn't know what it was, like it was something and now that type's gone, so now it's unlabeled. So if I run server, oh, it won't even let me run it. Because you have no access on unlabeled. It's like I don't know what the thing is, so you can't do it. Um, is this system fully constrained? Yeah, strict, not targeted. Um, so if I make it like this, it won't work. So then usually you start by making the base thing set up its own type for the thing that you want and do that part. And then I can actually just remove stuff here. So if I remove like all these uh, network parts, and then label it again, it sec vault. So that's not very useful. Then you can run audit to allow, which will read through your audit logs and convert the lines into um, like a policy thing. So this one's saying it needs access on bin T. The other way you can do is this uh, AU search, this line, AU search, dash m abc dash ts recent. So this lists all the lines in the last 15 minutes that have happened. So if you look here somewhere, there'll be uh, this one is user local bin server. It's trying to do all these different things. This is the file. This is the program that's trying to do it. This is the directory the program's in. Uh, you get the denied map at the bottom. Uh, so the audit logs are very verbose, and they're very, very good for finding out what happened in the system. So you run the audit daemon, and it collects everything. All the SE Linux denials and errors and everything go into the audit log, but not just SE Linux. Audit log actually collects a lot of things from the whole system. You can set up, you can even set up audit to look at a certain directory and tell you if anybody writes to the directory for any reason whatsoever. So if you really need to know certain things, audit is very powerful. Um, so if you look at this, then you'll see what the denial was. And then you go, oh, OK, I need to add that back. Then we add that one. Now load the policy again and try and run it. And now you get a different error. So writing the policies is very much an iterative approach. One way you can do it is just turn off. You could turn off SLNX completely and run it, and then see what the audit logs say, and then add everything. But that's a very bad way to do it, because a lot of the time, you don't actually need some of the permissions. Like some programs, for whatever reason, maybe will search a bunch of other files, which are completely not needed for their operation, but they just happen to do it anyway. So if you do it in permissive mode, you'll just add all the rules, which is the wrong way to do it. If you do it instead in enforcing mode, it'll hit one denial, and that'll be the one that makes it stop. You add that one and then keep going, then you'll get the smallest policy you can get that still lets it run, which is what you're aiming for. 
Um, so basically, uh, yeah. And audit is your friend. It has a whole bunch of features, so look into that. Is there a more automated way, like, to prove that the policy you have is like the most constrained one that you have for like, some program that develop policy for? I think if you can do that, you've solved the halting problem. So, <laughs> probably not. Okay. There are, that, that's why we have the interfaces. Because the interfaces, there's a lot of things that come together a lot of the time. So it's pretty obvious if you need to access the network, you need to do all these other things too. So you just use the interface and it will grant you the other permissions that almost always come along with it. So definitely use the interfaces and don't use these rules raw like they are because then you'll miss some of them or like uh, the interface will give you like the lock and the ioctal permission even though maybe you don't need it now but maybe later something changes and then you need to redo all your stuff so just use the interfaces and they cover most things and then you just need to look in bigger blocks instead of each granular individual permission because that gets really tiring otherwise um, Anything else? I guess that's it. Any other questions for Jason? Kind of getting towards the end of our time, so uh, any last yep. opportunities to ask? Yeah? Okay. Cool. So, Jason, I think yep. great to come along. Thank, Thank you. you. I'll put the slides up on my blog after. Maybe tomorrow or something. So, yeah. Okay. That's all. Um, so this is the cybersecurity Love track. Love T-shirt. <laughs> I forgot to talk about that. We got we got the next session starting about ten about well, eleven o'clock. So we've got about five minutes just to settle in. We'll continue from there. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Good. That was it.
<laughs> okay, so um, just already, just welcome to uh, FOSS Asia. So uh, Saturday track, um, what we've got is the cybersecurity um, topic, the no, cybersecurity track that we're covering here. And so just in between, we've got a lightning session with um, some of the students, I guess it is. Um, so really, they're from the United World College of Southeast Asia. Um, they're kind of uh, a group uh, focusing on, on ethical hacking. And so really nurturing the interest and the, the kind of participation in cybersecurity.